yeah, first, um, welcome to the tricky last session of the day. So hopefully the energy is still there. Yeah. So thanks very, very much for your, for your time and attention for the next, uh, 45 minutes or so. So yes. So this is a presentation on a project that, uh, my Mark Siddle and myself, Mark's one of our solutions architects at Splunk. Uh, we've been working on this project for the last couple of months, so it's fairly new. But this is something which we've showcased to people internally, um, a few customers, and it seemed to resonate really, really well. And we thought it was worth presenting. And uh, thankfully, it got accepted. So yeah, let's kick this off. So just a forward-looking statement. Uh, don't buy Splunk based on what I'm going to show you here, just in case if things change. So yeah. Just the legal stuff out of the way. Um, as I'm going to be talking in front of you for the next however long, I thought I'd give you some background on who I am. So I'm a solution en solutions engineer at Splunk. I've uh, been, been there since August 21. So coming up to three years now. Uh, I worked 12 years previously working for Capgemini in the UK. Um, six of those using Splunk. So various different hats on through from analyst through to architect. So I was a Splunk SME for uh, Capgemini in the UK and also uh, for one of my customers, which I worked client side with for quite a while. Uh, that customer is a large government customer. Uh, I won't mention who they are um, quite at the moment. But um, yeah, I worked with them within their SOC, um, worked and developed uh, automated fishing solution using Splunk SOAR. Um, also during COVID, um, I was heavily involved with creating solutions for tracking things like eat out to help out. I'm not sure if you've had that here. Probably not. That was a disaster. But um, yeah, things like job retention scheme and the like. So that went up to Rishi Sunak at the time. He wasn't PM at the time, but uh, yeah. So our dashboards got in front of him. Um, I'm an architect and enterprise security admin. And those are my details for anybody who wants to reach out afterwards with any questions if you don't ask them today. Um, I was born in Swansea, so uh, as the host just said, yeah, I'm Welsh, um, born, in, born and bred in Swansea. Family life keeps me busy. I'm massively into my cycling, so if anybody's into the cycling, please come and speak to me about that afterwards. Uh, I like talking about that as much as I like talking about Splunk. So, yeah, and just a few uh, memories from a conference that we run every every year called .conf, which is running next week, actually, in Vegas. So what I've tried to do with that introduction, I have tried to de-splunk a lot of these slides and try and make them ag as agnostic as possible. So um, obviously I work for Splunk and the solution is based around Splunk, but we do go into the fact that you could potentially use other tools if you want. I won't mention those tools, but you can use those other tools if you want to. So I'm going to start from the very beginning. I'm going to start from basics. How is a website made? So website. Base, uh, made of with HTML. Um, yeah, you've got your style sheets, you've got your scripts, uh, you've got your style, um, you've got your images, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But behind the scenes is JavaScript. Powers about 99% of all websites, uh, from dynamic content through to forms, uh, through to animations, etc., etc., etc. So basically, JavaScript is everywhere, everywhere today, and everywhere where we interact. Uh, this first party, so things that are hosted locally or third party, which are websites which are which take content from third parties. It's very basic, I know, uh, but it's something which kind of starts a story and is quite important. So how does it all work? So normal web browsing scenario, again, very basic. A client browses, brow the client browser accesses a website, fetches those resources such as images, JavaScript, style sheets, et cetera, et cetera, and the browser renders that page. And that's how it works. Yeah. Very, very simple. But again, very important to actually understand how the interaction is between the JavaScript, getting the JavaScript, getting the images, and where potentially things could get infiltrated. So the subject of today is webs website supply chain attacks and how we potentially uh, detect those using Splunk or various other tools. Uh, it's also known as e-skimming. Digital skimming, web skimming, um, Nagecart, 
form jacking, etc., etc. If you've heard those terms, it all applies to what we're going to talk about today. So a brief definition for those who don't know what, what it is. It's an attack whereby a malicious actor is able to get a client browser to execute crafted code on its behalf to obtain sensitive information or carry out other malicious activity. So potentially anything that's entered into a website form, potentially they could, uh, in, they could take that data and send it somewhere else potentially. So these, tax, uh, these attacks can take different forms in the way that they're instigated. So for instance, it could be a first, part, a first party compromise. So what will happen is the attacker compromises the web server and uploads malicious JavaScript code to that web server. A user comes along, visits that website as normal, and enters their details into a payment form. That, uh, that is then sent, uh, sorry, the user enters their personal data into that form. The malicious code has been scraped from that form by the JavaScript that's been infiltrated into the system. And then the form data is then sent to an attacker controlled infrastructure. The second one is third party compromise. So how this differs is that the attacker actually compromises the third party code. So outside of your website, outside of your domain, it attacks that third party code. The user again browses that form, goes to the payment form, enters their detail as, as normal. The web page references the third party J JavaScript. It takes, it loads, uh, the user's browser loads that JavaScript. The JavaScript scrapes the form data from that third party form and then the form data is then sent again to an attacker controlled infrastructure. So who's actually being affected by these blind spots? So we've got Browse Allowed, just to name, just to name three of the ones that, uh, that seem most prominent, was Browse Allowed. Uh, in 2018, attackers breached Browse Allowed, infected over 4,000 customer websites with Con CoinHive data, or CoinHive code, sorry. Uh, so yeah, lots of cryptocurrency mining going on behind the scenes at Browse Allowed. Uh, Mage Cut, so credit card theft, so threat actors employing online skimming. Um, this affected people like um, Magento, CMS, Ticketmaster, Newegg, and British Airways, unfortunately. Um, I do go into an example of British Airways and just show you how simple it is to actually do. Uh, Hannah Hansen, two for the last ones, clothing maker. This one's quite interesting because it was a $400,000 breach, but it went unnoticed for two months. So they were actually in the system for two months before anybody even knew what had happened, before they even knew that it was a problem. Um, and in that time period, there were 200,000 transactions. So quite worrying. So let's have a look at some code snippets of potentially this, uh, this supply chain infiltration. So this is an obfuscated um, example here, uh, basically uh, showing the injected JavaScript. So it was injected into a retargeting script um, designed to load skimming code. So as you can see, it's kind of trying to hide what they're doing. Um, so you can't actually see what's, what's going on within that, within this example. Um, the next one, unfortunately, is British Airways. So British Airways is, as you can see, is largely visible. You can see exactly what they're trying to do, what's going on behind the scenes, what they're actually doing. So this was 22 lines, 22 lines of code, and it breached credit card details for 380,000 British Airways customers. So all the, all the JavaScript does is it scrapes the form data, into a, JSON, into a JSON string, and then jQuery is used then to send it to a third party where it's then stolen and used on the internet. So very, very simple, not even hidden, uh, but was used and, yeah, as I said, affected nearly 400,000 customers. Google Tag Manager. So I think the tagline for this is, is loved by marketing, hated by security. Basically, Google Tag Manager is basically designed so that people can inject legitimate content into a website. It makes it very, very easy for admins who don't have any technical background just to inject that uh, new content into the website. Unfortunately, that can also be abused and used by uh, for a malicious reason. 
Uh, as you can see here, they're actually, the skimmer's actually using Base64 encoding as well, so it actually tries to hide any URLs or keywords that are actually used within this malicious code as well. So it just tries to, tries to cover their tracks as much as they can. Again, it's quite hard to detect. But something which is used everywhere. And uh, yeah, for, it can be good when it's used in the right reason, but can be very, very bad when not. So, how much of an issue actually is this? It turns out it's actually a very, very big issue with significant consequences. So, 443 online shops in, 2000, in 2003, the end of 2003, they were identified as being compromised with digital skimming. I think the second one's quite scary. Uh, so, we work very, very closely with uh, one of our partners, Recorded Future, and they found details of 71 million credit cards for sale online, which is quite, quite scary. 95% uh, of organizations have increased their focus on third-party risk assessment activity. So that's, that's also interesting from the perspective that what we're going to show you, or what I'm going to show you today, is, uh, is potentially in line with, with that new focus. And then 46%. So the Splunk State of Security 2023 report shows 46% of supply chain incidents in the past two years as well. So, that's kind of the so what, yeah? That's kind of why do we actually, why should we care about this? Is it actually a problem? Well, maybe those 71, one of those 171 million credit card owners probably would say, yes, it is. So why are they successful? So ultimately, web servers are largely internet facing by their nature. So they're, they're accessible. So they're good targets. Um, Third parties can be a weaker target, so if you're relying on third parties, then potentially they might not have the same levels of security or process or governance in place that you might have. Um, you might not know that, you might not be able to find out that, you might do if you don't do diligence, but potentially not. Um, it abuses the trust in the third party code as well, so you kind of think, right, okay, if I'm, if I'm signing up for a service, and I'm gonna use that service for a reason, for part of my website, functionality, then oh, it looks legit, it is legit, it's an industry recognized tool, so yeah, you kind of put some trust in that. And also, I think this is one, this is the biggest one really, is that it's not visible to the end user, so you could be online buying this, that, and the other off the internet, not thinking anything of it, you get the checkout, you get the confirmation, you get the product, you know, and you don't think anything of it, and all in the background, all this is going on. And there's also detection gaps, again, that feeds in very nicely to what we're going to try and talk about today and how we solve those problems. So yeah, so they typically focus on server side and network related data sources, um, and that's why these go undetected. So what's the impact? What's the impact of having these on the front page of the news or, you know, front page of the newspapers on whatever news outlet online, you don't want your name on there. So reputational damage can be massive, absolutely massive. So, you know, it can destroy some companies. Um, in the UK recently, you know, we've had things like um, what reputational damage can do to other companies, you know, with uh, certain scandals that have happened in the last six months or so. That's probably more related to the UK side. But, uh, yeah, we can see the damage, what, what happens when things go bad, yeah. Theft of personal data, obviously, that's... That's very, very bad. Very, very bad. It's gone, you know, we've, there's been regulations put in place recently to try and stop this, you know, to try and understand how we regulate that. So, pest theft of personal data is obviously a big impact. I think the third one, the regulatory one, so GDPR, I know that's UK and EU based now, there's slightly different versions, but uh, it's, it's relevant all over Europe. And the last one is the payment card industry. So, the standards that are been put forward by that industry. Basically, I'll come on to it later, but um, yeah, again, it's very, very, very important that when you have some of these breaches uh, within your company, then you're going to be pulled up on it for things like GPPR and PCI. Again, not something you want from your company. Am I holding the mic close enough? Can everybody hear, yeah? Yeah, cool. Uh, recommended controls. So what can organizations actually do to help protect their website users? So one thing is to set HTTP content security policy headers. That basically restricts what resources you actually feed in 
to your to your website. So that can be put in place, but often these aren't deployed. Uh, and workarounds exist, unfortunately, such as iframe, folder path, base URI exploits. The second one is sub-resource integrity or SRI. So uh, again, it's a way to sort of validate assets that are served to a web page. Um, again, something that you can do, but it creates extra processes in code updates. And sometimes extra processes are thinking, oh, we, that's too, too time cost, you know, cost too much time, too much effort. We, we won't do that. And they get, they get missed out. Um, and the other one is static analysis. Yeah. So you can download and analyze the content for yourself. So very, very time consuming. If you're, if you're eyeballing it and you're checking it yourself, um, or if you're using tools, again, still time consuming that you actually have to do this all manually. But I have my web server logs, so I should be okay, yes. So um, I do like a GIF, so I'm not going to apologize for that. Um, there's more to come as well. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a misconception, obviously, that I've got my web server logs, so everything should be fine. Yeah, I've got visibility of this, so it should be absolutely fine, yeah. And we're going to find out why it's not. So we're just going to revisit what we talked about previously. So when we look at the first party compromise, and we look at the, the flow through the website about how the attack has actually compromised the web server within your domain, within your estate. Uh, it's uploaded that JavaScript code. It's, the users use the form as normal. The, it's entered the data. The code's been, the, the data's been scraped and it's been sent. My SOC is monitoring this and then they're looking at their Apache, their Nginx, their IIS logs and yeah. Everything looks fine to me. Everything's all right. Yeah, I don't see any malicious activity there or no problems at all. Everything's fine. And it goes undetected. Third party compromise. Again, same thing, but with the attacker compromising the third party code instead, flows through the state, flows through the forms, the form data sent, as, no, as, as in the first example. Again, we go to my SOC. They look in the same logs. It's in a third party, so I've got no visibility of this. And again, looks fine to me. I go to my sock, nothing, no problems here. So I just uh, carry on. Basically, it's the case of the missing log entries. So my, what my web server doesn't do is it doesn't tell me things like the posts to a third party. Uh, it doesn't tell me the gets from a third party. Uh, and usually, usually, uh, the victims of these um, stolen, these details that are stolen, basically, they usually sit outside of your domain. So whenever you look at web server logs, you're going to find that everything looks fine, when in fact, it's not. Web server logs give you visibility into a lot of areas, but not third party interactions, unfortunately. So this is where it comes into, we need to start thinking differently to actually protect our users. So just to sum up to this point, basically we've given you some background on the technology behind a web page. Yeah, we started off really simple. Uh, we explained the issue that it can arise with infiltration scenarios. Yeah, we've, we've got, um, there's been examples of where this issue has been found with some real world customers. Um, some of those examples use different methods to actually get the data. So there's different ways to actually infiltrate, whether it's obfuscated or unobfuscated. Um, Ultimately, why should we care? Well, we've also explained that. We should care from, you know, if, uh, from regulatory perspective, from reputation, et cetera, et cetera. That's the, that's the so what, that's, that's why should we care? The impacts of those breaches, as I've just said. Um, the lack of visibility using server logs to detect these breaches. So we, we've come across that, that I've looked up, I've gone to my SOC guys, I've asked them if there's any problems. No, absolutely no problems at all. So ultimately, we need to change how we're detecting these problems and these issues. So there's a quote from securitymetrics.com, a blog post that was posted there. Um, the basis and the subject, as you see in the bottom there, was how to prevent form jack and e-commerce skimming. And the quote is, we realized that we couldn't just look at the web server anymore. We have to look at the code as it's rendered in the browser. But we don't monitor data from the browser. Yeah. So we come on to the solution, which is enter the HAR file 
And again, I'm not going to apologize for the ha 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 gif there. Um, it was funny at the time, not so sure now, but yeah. Uh, but isn't the HAR file used for performance monitoring and troubleshooting? Historically, it is. It's usually used for that, but can absolutely be used from a security perspective. And that's kind of the basis of what we're going to talk about now. What is a HAR file? HAR file is a HTTP archive format file. It's JSON formatted, so it's consumable in most tools. It's a recognized format used everywhere. Um, it logs all browser interactions with a web page. So, hello, client-side activity. We can actually get an insight now into what's actually going on in the browser, which up until now, we've had no visibility of that whatsoever. It includes all requests, so gets, posts, everything to first and third party resources as well. So you've got a full inventory of what's being requested. And it also includes request and response headers. So lots of security posture stuff in there as well. Hmm. Sounds really useful, but how do I get a HAR file? So in the, for the purpose of this solution, we're, uh, we're using Splunk Observ Observability Cloud, so the synthetics part of Splunk Observability, Observability Cloud. Uh, but you can do it via multiple different tools. So you can use Puppeteer if you need to, Selenium, or basically any other synthetic monitoring transaction recorder, basically. So any any which you have, have within your estate with at your disposal, you can use those. For the purpose of this, we're using, like I said, synthetics within Splunk Ollie. So our approach. So I put the tagline here that it's not a replacement, although it possibly could end up being, but um, we realize that there are other solutions out there which exist. Uh, but we see this as a supplement using tools that you likely already have. So I know that there's lots of organizations across the world have every monitoring tool known to man within the estate, you know, and it's, you kind of find that there's silos within those big customers as well, and they basically use whichever team prefer. Um, but we're using Splunk, obviously, uh, for this, and we think that this approach gives you a very good solution at detecting those web supply chain attacks. So step one, we're going to identify a target workflow. So we're going to look on our website, we're going to understand what route through my website that I want to actually monitor and we're going to record that journey. So here we have a mock-up of a very fake boutique website that we use for testing and the flow here is you're looking at a vintage typewriter, um, quite reasonably priced as well, $67. And we're going to add that to the cart. So if you imagine this is your journey through any retail store, you look at the item, you're adding it to the cart, you go into the checkout, and you're entering your details as normal. If you use sites a lot, then those will probably already be pre-populated. And you place the order. You get the nice confirmation screen to say your order is complete, and a few days later, your item arrives. We're going to capture this so that we can use this journey then in, in a half file to then detect many malicious activity which goes on within this journey. So step two is we're going to generate the synthetic transaction in your tool of choice, of course. Again, there are multiple options out there, but we're using Splunk Observability Cloud and we're using synthetics to do this. Please don't everybody go and have a coffee. Now. I got really confused when we did this slide and I wasn't quite sure if it was the right message. I thought everybody just disappear and say, right, okay, it's time to have a coffee. But what we're trying to show is that you wait a few minutes, that synthetic transaction will actually go away and actually execute and the results will come back. Yeah. So yeah, wait a few minutes for the synthetic transaction to percolate. Um, and when we've done that, we'll come back and we'll go on to step three, which is extract that HAR file from the transaction results. And then you analyze it. 
Yeah, so you can either do old school and do catblar.json, yeah, and look at the file manually and see what the contents of that, see if there's any, um, any details which have been, which have been skimmed, basically, contained within that file. Or you can ingest it into your favorite data platform, whatever that may be. Um, obviously for the purpose of this, we're using Splunk, but you can use others. So, yeah. And that's just a synthetic transaction and how it looks when it's recorded. I've used Area 41's website. So just to, just to show that we can just get that synthetic journey and, uh, and record it. And also give you the playback of that and all the various different components that come back within that transaction as well. So all your images, all your style sheets, every single element within that journey. Okay, so then what? Once we've done that, then what do we do? So what we do is we can schedule that transaction and the data collection process. So again, we've, we've, we've built a Splunk add-on to do this. So anybody who's familiar with what Splunk does, We've got Splunk Base, which is like an app store. You've got various different add-ons and apps within there. You can download and makes the data, getting data into your system much, much easier. We do all the sort of normalization around that. We built that for this. So it takes it a feed directly from Splunk as observability cloud, uses the API to send the data to Splunk. Then what do we do? We've got to test it works. Yeah. So we need to test that it works and uh, just to prove and it's going to be okay to then start rolling it out. We've got to go through certain processes to get the app or add-on onto Splunk Base so that other customers and other users can actually start using it as well. So what do we do? We bring up our fake website, the wonderful boutique website that I showed you earlier, and then we inject the JavaScript to scrape the form data and send it elsewhere. So we go back to our, uh, our website we're going through the same journey, going th adding the same things to our cart. We're placing that order. But the difference here is that this checkout page now has been instrumented with JavaScript injection. We've got a process in place behind the scenes, which basically allows you to change the website, inject certain scenarios into that fake website so that we can test it. So that's what we did. We injected that JavaScript into the, into the website to see what what would happen and whether we could get the information that we required. And it worked. So basically the injected JavaScript, you can see that the form data is actually being exfiltrated. So you can see that the credit card data is, is all in the payload with all the details of that person just from attaching um, a supply chain attack if, uh, JavaScript script into the mix. We've been able to get all that information and send it to a, send it to an external, external source, which, yeah, is obviously not good, but it's very good for us because it proves the point of what we're trying to achieve here is that it's incredibly easy to do. So next, synthetic transaction run. So you can do this on five minute basis, 10 minutes, whatever that may be, whether you run it every hour on your website, then the synthetic transaction will run in the background. The half file is collected and it's parsed and ingested, in this case, into Splunk. And what do we get? We get something like this, which is something that we've mocked up just to show how easy it is to kind of visualize this. Um, so this is our web website supply chain monitoring dashboard within Splunk. Um, you can do it by time. You can do it by different tests. So if we had different sources that we were looking at, so different half files, you know, different user journeys, you can, you can look at all of them together. You can look at separate ones. Um, you can see the sort of content types, whether they're images that come back within all the contents within those half files. You can look at the resource type based on locations. So you can see if they're third party, you can see if they're first party. So you can see if you've maybe got a big spike in first party or third party to see where your vulnerabilities may be. One thing I think which is extra important is the geographic location information. So we bring all that information back as well and we can plot it out in a, in a simple map. But I think the value of this screen I think is in the middle. So what we found from the half file and what we can see historically from continued monitoring of half files within 
across your estate and across that same user journey is we've got a new domain. So we found a new domain which is being used as part of our supply chain. We've also seen a new resource which hasn't see, been seen before as well. So you see a detection that hasn't been seen before across all of your checks that you've been running. And also you can see that the content size has changed, which is a telltale sign that somebody's been playing around with potential JavaScript files. Maybe you know, you've got a content management system which uh, is sending, sending files out to all your resources. There might be a legitimate reason for that. You know, you might have, uh, you might, somebody might have made a change, but this will detect that and it'll give you that sort of understanding of whether you need to investigate that further or, or not. But all this coming from the half file being created, that user journey being created, ingested into your data platform and then analyzed in a very simple way. And this is continuous, yeah? It's continuous. This isn't manual. This is continuous process of your site. And you can go and do this for any kind of user journey, all your sort of, uh, your well-trodden paths within your website. You can do this for, and it'll show up in this website when there's any sort of detections and changes. So we can go a step further. Yeah. So, um, again, not to focus too much on Splunk. And I think it's, it's, again, it's, like an, it's an agnostic topic is that you could put another, you could put other things and add things onto this, things like, um, automation. So if you know that there's things that are brought up in here, potentially ways that you could use like a, like a orchestration automation sort of remedial action response. In, in your tool of choice, which uses, you know, whichever logic you want in order to maybe block or maybe change or maybe do whatever you need to do to protect your system. You can alert on this. Again, you know, I think I like to call it again slapped in the face. You know, you need to be known about, you need to know about these things. If something is happening within your estate, which you don't know about, the 380,000 customers, the British Airways, uh, it got affected. Basically, if they'd had an, an alert which said that potentially there's a new domain within your estate, then potentially that would have been a lot less. Um, some of the others, you know, the money side of things, the reputational damage, that could have been massively reduced. So great, yeah? Yeah? Really good. I think Mark, my colleague Mark, couldn't be here today. Um, but I feel this perfectly represents him. Big fan of the office, so I had to put that in for him. So, I think what I've shown you here is how we've taken a problem, which seems to be a big problem, um, a problem which has gone largely um, invisible to, to a lot of customers, to a lot of monitoring, to a lot of socks. It's essentially not something which is perfectly, you know, which is visible. And easily, uh, yes, there are um, there are tools out there which do exactly this, uh, but potentially they could be too expensive, or it's not something which you have in the estate, or it's something which you just haven't thought about. And potentially there's a way that you could do this with tools that you already have, as I said before. So how do we leverage these data insights? So from a security monitoring analytics perspective, we're capturing the resources delivered to the browser into an inventory. So all this data, all these half files you're ingesting into Splunk or whichever data platform you're using, they all get captured historically, archived. You know, from archive purposes, you've got that all ready to search whichever way you want and use that data in whichever way you want. You can detect an alert on those code changes and resource nothing before, as I said just now. That alerting aspect, I think, is something which could save a lot of time, anguish, and, yeah, a lot of problems that you're seeing. Any new third-party domains? Again, you can get those and from the data that we're ingesting here. Content size comparison, again, geolocation, as I've shown on the dashboard, very simple to see where these are coming from, potentially, or where they've been sent to, potentially. And the head of security posture as well. So all the information that we're getting from that half file that we said just now, it can all be used for the analytics purposes and security purposes as well. And plug in that gap that you potentially don't know that you have yet. Now, I talked about it earlier, and I wish I wish I could have said that we knew this was going to happen, and we and we came up with this idea because of this. But coincidentally, this happened very shortly after we'd come up with this idea. 
and it kind of fitted in perfectly. So uh, we could get away with saying that we we did it because of this, but uh, this was a total and uh, a fluke. But uh, be a bit too honest there, I guess. But there's PCI DSS changes that came in um, recently in version four. Uh, they come into effect in a they came into effect in April, sorry, as best practice, but will be mandatory by or March 31st next year. And what those are are basically the payment card industry data security standard. Again, version four released last uh, released in March 2022. They made some changes this year and they introduced 64 new requirements. Now, two of those requirements were 643 and 11.61. And what those requirements are is you need to manage all your payment page scripts that are loaded and executed in the consumer's browser. Which, when we saw that, it was like literally, you, you got to be kidding me, it's like they literally wrote it for us. So as as we were presenting this, this came up like the day before, so we could just use that in our presentation, which was really good. And that this method will get all that information for you. And then LM61 is a change in tamper detection mechanisms and deployed for payment pages. Again, fits perfectly with this um, with this solution. So yes, we couldn't believe our luck really. But um, but yes. And whoever's phone that was, that's perfect timing because uh, thanks for the point there. So yes, that was my last slide. Hopefully that made sense and way and hopefully you see the value in where where this sits. Because I think that from everybody we've shown it to so far, they've they've seen massive value in potentially rolling this out to their estate, seeing how we could actually use it in uh, in our customers. So um, hopefully you see the value here. Um, I'm more than happy to take any questions or um, try and answer them if I can. It's uh, great. All those hands going up. That's good. Yeah. Um, if I can't answer them, I'll take them away. Uh, but yeah, um, yep. Could you maybe repeat the question for the audience at home? Yeah, can you say it again? Sorry. Or here. Do you think that with the new PCI requirement that some attackers are going to try to omit uh, detection by delivering? depending on the client or, or depending on the source IP uh, to deliver clean scripts or evil scripts. Like it happens for VirusTotal and some others yeah. where they deliver the, the malware mm -hmm. only to... Yeah. Um, I, th I, th I think the simple answer to that is yes. I think if, 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 if they're not doing that, then they're, they're not very good at what they're doing. Um, I think, you know... It's like anything, isn't it? It's like any sort of like infiltration. There's always going to be people who try and get that step ahead of you. And there's always going to be things that you need to then change. I think in the current world, in the current world that we're looking at right now, and yes, that might change with the PCI changes that are coming in. Yes, it's almost, it's almost giving them, giving the, giving the, the hackers the, basically the green light and focusing on, yes, we need to change this now and go in a different direction. Yeah, potentially. So I think yes is ultimately the answer. But the way that I see it is that there'll be so many, <laughs> there'll be other ways in which we could then detect that. You know, there'll, be, there'll, there'll always be signs of infiltration, whether it's the way that we've just talked about today. I think skimming will just start to become something different. You know, ultimately the methods that are used are used today that I've gone over today, some of the examples, but then if they do then clean up their act and start trying to hide themselves m even further, they're still gonna, there'll still be ways to try and detect it and then we need to pivot and try and find a way to actually then monitor it. It's, it's, it's the monitoring game, yeah? It's ultimately, it, it doesn't matter whether it's, uh, whether it's this use case, it could be something else, you know, that we're always trying to keep up and get ahead of the, of the bad stuff. So, so yes, yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah. Was so there, one, still, was there have, one more? Yeah, we have more time still for some questions. If we have any more, please put your hands up. Don't be shy. It's the, really the last time of the day to do this. I know uh, I know. everybody wants barbecue. I, know, I, know you're I waiting, haven't had a beer but... yet, so I've been holding off having a beer. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but if there's any other questions, or if you want to grab me after this, or email me, my email address is die at splunk.com. I'm the one and only. So... <laughs> What's the name of the Splunk app? 
So the Splunk app. So this, this, we originally came up with the idea of calling it Crossing the Streams. Now, um, anybody, any, any Ghostbusters fans in the room will uh, appreciate that. But also it has other connotations as well, which uh, weren't quite uh, well received. So the Crossing the Streams reference was the fact that we're using observability type methods along with data analytics. So it kind of crosses that. And we, we, we're talking about that from a like Splunk, Splunk perspective, from Splunk observability and Splunk enterprise kind of comes together, hence crossing the streams. Um, that was quickly poo-pooed. And oh, I, I think you should have gone with it. I think we should go that, with that it as was, well. That's, so that's might have solid. a vote, actually. Maybe if people can email me if in, in support of crossing the streams. Yeah, maybe. But um, unfortunately, in true Splunk fashion, we like to call things exactly what they are. Exactly. So it's called the Har Ingester add-on for Splunk. Uh, <laughs> crossing the streams is so much better, yeah? So much better. But um, yeah, I'm not sure that I'll get past um, the process. But uh, yes, it's not on Splunk Biz as yet, but hopefully soon. I know. So we've still got time to change it. So, um, But yes, if you want to talk to me afterwards, um, I can. we can probably have a conversation around that and get maybe get you early access to it. Yeah. Nice. Especially Splunk users, you know. So, so all hope is not lost for crossing streams to still yeah. be there. Nice. Yeah, we we'll, uh, we'll try our best. We we'll try our best. <laughs> yeah. Last uh, opportunity for questions. If not, then as Di mentioned, he will also be sticking with us for the barbecue and drinks later. So absolutely. definitely catch him there if you don't want to ask now. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, guys, we made it. Thank you so much. <laughs> we are here. Thank you, Di. First of all, again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cheers.